Hello, and welcome to this special episode of Married to Cinema. I'm Brian. I'm Whitney. And I typically love movies. I typically don't. So, on this special episode, we're doing a, a double stuff one in which we're focusing on two different films in which we hear the uh, thoughts of dogs. I will put it that way. So... We are going to start with The Art of Racing in the Rain from last year. Okay. Would you like to talk about this one? Uh, so, as a preface, one of these movies I liked. One of these movies, Brian liked. I liked The Art of Racing in the Rain. I thought it was good. And I know he's going to rip me a new one for that in a few minutes. But, um, it is about... A uh, young man that wants to be a Formula One race car driver meets a young woman. They fall in love. He has this dog. And you see the story through the perspective of his pet. Um, the dog, his thoughts are narrated with the voice of Kevin Costner as he's looking over his owner's life. Yeah, so... Excuse me. Uh, you see the dog narrating this story um and like one of the very first things the dog says is that he had seen this um documentary where in some beliefs if you believe hard enough your soul can imprint and your like memories can travel with you to your next life well long story short it's an incredibly emotional movie um the woman that the young man who owns the dog marries, um, like, spoilers, spoilers are happening, I can't not talk about spoilers, uh, passes away, cameo by Gigi, passes away from, uh, a tumor, brain tumor, they have a young daughter together before she passes, and he fights for custody with the, the in-laws for the, you know, to have the young daughter at, at his house, and, um, it's like one of those stories where every time it looks like it's going to turn up, something bad happens. Um, and it ultimately ends with the man going to Italy to drive Formula One cars for, um, is it Fiat? Is that the one? I don't think it was Fiat. Uh, Ferrari. Ferrari, thank you. Ferrari and, uh just generally getting his life together. What did you think? Um, so if you notice, we're, we're kind of rushing this one because we basically did this episode already, but Sorry. we lost it due to a technical issue. So we're, uh, this is a redo, a redux, but one we're rushing through. Um, and there are several things to talk about with this film. I did not care for it however Whitney here did she found it very emotional mm -hmm. and I found it emotional emotionally manipulative and very much so like it's one that's geared towards these like dog lovers who like go to movies for like dog movies like I'm talking about like a dog's purpose and Marley and me and just films like that that serve no other purpose than to appease dog owners. <laughs> we have a cat I'm scratching sorry. a cardboard box it was in the background. It was distracting so. and very cute. Um, unfortunately, Unlike this film. I am the audience that will go see those movies. Thoroughly enjoyed Marley and Me. Um, also very sad. Uh, maybe one day. Maybe one day uh, we can review that one. <laughs> but um, I, you say emotionally manipulative. I say digging into actual situations like I find brain these... injuries and, and disease are real things. They are real, but they're forced into the story. Like, the right, this is based on a novel, and it's obvious that the writer of this was kind of zeroing in on what this person knew would make a bestseller. There is a formula. It's like making a blockbuster film in terms of narrative. There is a certain formula you can follow, 
look at the the MCU, for example. I might catch flack for saying this, but look at the MCU. They follow a formula. Bad guy has some point and wants to destroy mankind or something, and the heroes are like, no, don't. Cue fight scenes and some enjoyable antagonists or protagonists. Regardless, there's a formula, and with this, it's the same. Like, get the people in with the emotional angle, with some things that they can relate to in real life, and then kind of rip their heart out. And that is the angle for these these dog movies. It's the same with every single one of them. But I don't know why I'm yawning so much, and I apologize. But I don't know. I mean, I still found the plot enjoyable and developed enough. I found it very predictable, and I found very little merit throughout the whole film. Um, I didn't think the acting was very good, um, even with a lot of some very good, more character-prone actors like Martin Donovan, who's in this film. He's a very good actor, but he is... He's just running through the motions and just delivering his lines for the paycheck in this. And there's no chemistry between any of the actors. What's the name of the girl? Amanda Seyfried. Is she the little girl from Mamma Mia? Yes, she is. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. I didn't realize that until we were almost done, though, because... <laughs> you mean the girl from Twin Peaks, The Return? Yes, yes she is. Yes, I remember that, too. Cue weird convertible scene. Oh, we'll get to Twin Peaks again later on in this episode. So... I don't know. I enjoyed the movie. However, I grew up watching stuff like this. This reminds me, you're talking about formulas, right? Formula One. The, <laughs> not Formula One. You're talking about formulas for like blockbuster movies or the yeah, MCU. Okay. The formulaic nature sure. of, blo of just standard uh, popcorn um, munching cinema. Being a teacher, I constantly look for patterns of behavior. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> and learning uh, spikes and where we can see consistent uh, patterns in things so that we can track them, right? Because data, data, data. Well, this movie, I didn't realize till thinking about it in hindsight, reminds me very much... Pardon, GG clearly needed to walk through. GG crossing, um, we need a GG crossing sign <laughs> in the background. Um, this movie reminded me a lot of like your average Christian movie. Like your it's Christian very blockbuster. Much like, that. like a Tyler Perry like minus Medea. Like <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like Oh absolutely. I didn't realize it till later. I was like I was wondering if they were gonna bring in a, like a biblical aspect at some point. Yeah. I was sort of waiting for it to tie back to a verse or like, it like it reminds me of these films. Fireproof is one of them. Yeah. And it um, has the a lot war of the, room. It has the motions and the mismatched tone throughout for that because the there's like the tone isn't very well realized throughout. Like they jump around. Right. Um, well, and this continue, though. this film was suggested to us by my mother and her boyfriend, um, who are practicing Christians. Um, so it would make sense that they would enjoy this kind of film. I know that they often go out of their way to watch the newest God's Not Deads and all that. Um, the only other person I know is a devout Catholic, and she really enjoyed this film as well. Yeah, so... so I guess it's like, it's that market. In hindsight, I imagine that had something to do with my enjoyment of it, I will say. And that's fair, and I, I will say this, I really enjoyed the soundtrack, although my biggest surprise with the soundtrack is that they used a song by uh, one of my favorite bands, Low, who is a Mormon group, actually. So, to make things even funnier, tackling on to this whole uh, Christian Catholicism analysis, even though she's not Catholic, but my, my friend was still. A Mormon band has a song in this. Uh, Loose Mormon. Anyway, I just thought that was funny. Um, but it's the, the point I wanted to make, though, was the tone. Like, it veers off after this major tragedy with the wife happened, and it tries to be a silly dog movie for a moment. Yeah. And it's, it's just forced. It's very forced. And there are just moments of this film that just feel forced. 
So, um, to backtrack again, when the daughter is born earlier on, there's the dog makes a makes a comment through his like voiceover narration, like, "I was disappointed that the kid didn't look more like me," and I'm like, my only thought was, "Oh my god, the wife fucked the dog." That's all I could think about, and it's like this. This movie, it tries to be sincere and funny, but it just comes off as schlocky and forced in my eyes. I am not the audience for this, so I am analyzing this from a different critical perspective. Well, and I agree with you that the humor is definitely forced. Like, Mm -hmm. we've definitely got some issues going on with timing and just continuity. Um, because, I mean, he's, the dog has been, like, a reasonably stoic character, I would say, through the first quarter to, to a half of this film, and then it's like, oh, also, I'm fighting with a stuffed zebra, and, like, they have this, like, odd, like, really jarring animation of a stuffed zebra that's like, hee 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 hee, and it's like, mocking the dog when he's been left in the house during an emergency. And it's just, it's given to us out of nowhere. There's no build-up to yeah, this. Yeah, there's no It's just build. suddenly fed when the dog is left alone after the mother has to go to the hospital and the father is away doing his work with his race cars. And it's forced. All of a sudden, there's this conflict with a stuffed zebra and we're supposed to buy into it. And it's like, what? Yeah, like, that was... Yeah, I agree that that was... Uh, and then there's also... It leaves a lot of questions, like, what drugs are you on and where can I get some? <laughs> well, there's also... They try to put a little humor in towards the last section, last fifth of the movie, I guess, um, where it's like uh, the dog has been going to stay with the grandparents because that's where the daughter is at this time, and it eats a hot pepper and does, like, a diarrhea poo all over the floor, Simply to get back at the, the... The the in-laws. Yeah, the in-laws. So it's like, okay? And the I thing mean, is, <laughs> the in-laws are trying to take custody of the, the child after the mother's death. And their reason for doing so is, in my opinion, not wrong at all. I think they have a very valid point that they want the daughter to have a stable home after dealing with this tragedy. Right. Since the father is always away on work which is why the dog was left alone in the first place in a prior scene but the father still raises a stink over this like no it's my daughter but they were the in-laws were very kind like still come visit her be a part of her life we just think like she needs stability <coughs> Bless you. right and i agree with the in-laws on this so then the rest of the movie i'm just like but the dad's kind of a shithead he's a shithead <laughs> I mean, yeah, you do. I mean, I'm not going to deny that you feel... I think the movie wants you to feel really bad for the dad. Like, look at this poor guy. He married a girl, and then that girl had cancer and died, and now he doesn't get to see his daughter, and his dog gets hit by a car. Like, Oh, yeah, and there's no it, reason. It, we don't really but understand we don't... why he even fell in love with the wife. Like, there is, there's no substance there. It's just like, oh, he meets her, they get married. Yeah. And that's it. Even well, the dog doesn't was... seem to understand it. He's like, I guess he loves her, so it I It was funny her when my mom was like, pitching this movie to me on one of our Sunday walks about a month ago and she was like, oh my god, you haven't seen this movie, it was so great. She, like, was giving me a lot of, like, plot points, but she was giving them to me so fast I thought the movie must be hours and hours long, right? But actually, no. it's not that long. They <laughs> just, like, they are not wasting yeah, time. We have time don't, they, to develop chemistry. <laughs> well, <laughs> they just, and they just don't understand what characters or pacing are. They're like, um... Uh, here are some ideas. Uh, we called this a movie. But let me, and but here you go, guys. Art of let me be the clear. Rain. Let me Racing. be clear. I sound like I'm saying on this movie. I really enjoyed this movie. I would watch this. Well, I would recommend someone else to watch it. I don't know that I could watch it again because I cried for from Seven, about forty days and forty nights. <laughs> That's why it's taken so long for us to get the new episode out. We I just, cried. We just got the flood wiped away. I cried from about 20 minutes into this film through Until, way past uh, the end. Until last night. Yeah. 
No, it was bad. It was bad, though. Like, it made me cry a lot. Um, which is like, am I a glutton for punishment? Is that why I like this? I don't know. But. I, I love emotional films, but to me, like, they have to be genuine. Like, films like Philomena, for example, is a very emotional film, and I don't think it's manipulative, though. I think it's a very genuine film. Whereas this one, it forces the viewer to feel certain ways, and it's, it, its plot points don't really feel organic as much as they feel just tacked on and forced to become a part of this formula. So, let's rate it and compare it to our funny doggy movie counterpart. Okay, so I give this film a 2. I absolutely hated this movie, except for the soundtrack. Okay. Which also had George Harrison. Is He's that why it gets the 2? Yes. Uh, okay. George Harrison Lowe, my favorite Beatle. Okay. Yeah. Fair Gotta enough. go uh, two. I would give this a seven. All right. Solid flick IMO. I will say, like, if this is the movie that fits what you are into, for example, these this series of movies that are emotional to people featuring dogs, like I said, they're... They're very formulaic, but there is a big market for that, particularly with the Christian crowd. So, if that fits your demographic, then you would probably enjoy this, I will say. It was, however, for people like me who are very critical on cinema as a whole in general, typically, it's not for people like me. If you do casual viewing, you might like it. Um, but... Because it was so rough on me emotionally. GG Crossing. Sorry. No, you can't just sit there. Okay. Um, sorry. Really? Would you like to talk about the next movie? She would. Yeah, so, I guess our... No. GG's <laughs> like, oh, but I don't... I'm camera shy. So, the other movie we watched in order to give some... Bring some comedy to this difficult time I was having with this other one is Homeward Bound. The Incredible Journey. And would you like to give a summary on that one? Okay. So it is about this uh, this family. It's, uh, it becomes a blended family. The father marries in to this woman who already has kids and he already has a kid. And they kind of just merge and they have these animals, two dogs and a cat, and they all take to one of the children. There's three children, so each one basically has their own little pet that they care for very greatly. And Robert Hayes is the patriarch, which is fun for any airplane fans out there. And it is a, um, it follows this family. They go on a trip, and they leave the, the animals in the care of their neighbor. And the animals who are they can talk to each other and they are voiced by uh, different people so there's one dog voiced by Michael J. Fox who is the younger more rambunctious dog Sally Field voices the Siamese cat and then the older wiser dog Shadow <clears throat> uh, is voiced by uh, Don Amesh was I believe was his name who passed shortly after this film was completed and um, they speak to each other, and Chance, the, the young dog, who is obviously the pet of the young youngest child, the Michael J. Fox voiced one, like, convinces them, because he was recently rescued, that, oh my god, they're taking us back to the pound. I've been through this before. You guys haven't. Oh my god, no, we can't go back to the pound. So they escape, and they go out into the, to the wilderness. To, f to get home, right? Yeah, to get home, to... To find their their family again, which leads them through <clears throat> an incredible journey. He said the title. He said the title. Uh, that's the title of the original. This one's Homeward Bound: The Incredible Journey. I made that mistake before. Then I wound up watching the 1960s Incredible Journey, and I was very bored. It's like, why aren't they talking? Why aren't they talking? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so. so I think the only time I had seen this movie, other than when you and I watch it, and I don't remember too much of it, is I was about six years old. We were on vacation. 
and my Aunt Jenny and I watched this movie, and I bawled at the end. Absolutely lost my shit. Like, could not get it together for any amount of money. And I think the ending, the emotional aspect of the ending, is well earned, because it's about this incredible journey, and the return of one of the animals, like, is... They kind of drag it out and prolong it, and it works. And then when when the climax happens, it's it's beautiful. I think it is very well earned because it's a plot point that they kind of hold like to the side because the more like hot shot of the dog's chance, Michael J. Fox is trying to be more the forefront where Shadow is the wiser. So it makes to me it makes more sense the older, slower, wiser dog would be the one to bring it all back home, no pun intended, in the in the finale for me. So I think, like, the emotional aspect of the ending, it doesn't make me emotional personally, but I think it's it's a very good scene, the, the final shot. So, okay. There were things I liked about this, and there were things I didn't like. I thought it had good humor for a kid's movie. Yeah. I mean, the Siamese cat gets flung off of the um, seesaw into the sandbox, and she's like, they threw me in the big glitter box. <laughs> like, good kid jokes. Good kid jokes. Uh, had I been six or seven watching this a second time for a movie review, I would have also said something about the good kid jokes. But, <laughs> but, uh, I... <laughs> Did not like it when the Siamese cat went over the waterfall. They lost me. They lost me. This poor cat tries to go over the waterfall. They don't get it in time. Or tries to go over the, across the river. Gets sucked up and shoots over the waterfall. And like is presumed dead for the next few minutes. Until they cut to another scene where she's like... She's recovered. Yeah, well they... This dude picks her up, and this, like, guy that lives out in the wilderness, and he's like, you're alive? And, like, that's terrible. She was so close to death. I didn't like that. It's sad, but that's what, that's what, so to go back to the source material, it started with the novel, and that's what it's all about, is, like, these animals, like, strive for survival, and even these domesticated pets, like, becoming strong enough to survive and finding their way through the wilderness even though that they had not adapted to it prior which i think is a really strong interesting concept so okay did you ever see my or read milo and otis i saw the film version a long time ago i feel like it's like very similar that was the other thing is like i got like major milo and otis vibes yeah but whereas milo... otis also is a cat that gets swept away by the river. Yeah, but does Milo and Otis feature the voice of Marty McFly? No. Exactly. I mean, but... I don't know. I felt it was... You're like, oh, it's very an interesting concept. And I'm like, I feel like... It's kind of been done. It has in a sense. This is... This is a very similar... But also, it, it does its own things with it. In terms of the execution, I feel like it's... God, I vaguely remember Milo and Otis, so I don't remember the setup for it. But I get where you're coming from. Yeah, like, I mean, it wasn't... I'm not even sure which one predates the other. Is the novel Incredible Journey or the Milo and Otis? I At the risk of sounding really, really ignorant, I think Milo and Otis is older. Okay, because I think the... I think. Because I believe the novel, The Incredible Journey, was from the 50s, and then they made The Incredible Journey film in the is 60s. It, does it the source material material for Milo and Otis come from a French author? Might. I'm not sure. If you know the answer, yes. comment below. We are not entirely sure. <laughs> I do not teach children's literature. Yeah. I did not <laughs> I did not do too much research on this one because I did not expect a Milo and Otis versus Homeward Bound discussion. Because <laughs> I just enjoy Milo and Otis, or I just enjoy Homeward Bound and I It wasn't I'm a, bad. I'm a Michael J. Fox fan. What can I say? If I Michael J. Fox is in it, I'll watch it. If I had small children, 
and it was time to sit down and rest for the evening, I'd put that movie on. I'd put Homeward Bound on. Yeah. I don't have anything against it. I just, it was okay. Yeah. You know, it was very middle of the road for me. Yeah, and I uh, I made the uh, the allusion to Twin Peaks earlier with Amanda Seyfried, and I mentioned that that would come back. So here we go. The director of it, which I don't recall his name, it's Dwayne something, but he was a director on the original TV series of Twin Peaks. Um, directed several episodes, including Silent episode two. Silent Curtain Runners. Well, that was season two. But he directed episode two, so just to bring that back. Talking Dog Movies and Twin Peaks. Welcome to episode nine of Married to Cinema. We should start giving our episodes titles like that. Just kidding. Don't. We're not going to do that. We want you to know what we're reviewing. That was dumb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't think that I just say the stuff. Hey, I like that idea too. <laughs> Talking dogs and Twin Peaks. That sounds like a folk album. That could be the the like the, the Lost the, John Fry uh, album. <laughs> Talking Dogs and Twin Peaks, a tribute to John Prine. <laughs> that can be the um, subheading or whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, do you did you want to rate that one? I mean, Homer Brown, The Incredible Journey, I will say, I it had been a very long time since I would seen this one. I loved it when I was much younger. I always enjoyed the second one more. Uh, for some weird reason. I think it's because of Sinbad. Sinbad is fun for me. I haven't um, seen the second one at all. Lost so. in San Francisco by David Ellis, R.I.P., director of Snakes on a Plane and Final Destination oh, 2. Oh, what a, what a humbling yes. uh, catalog Homer, to Homer fall Bound back 2, on. Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco, is probably my favorite film of his, though. <laughs> um, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Your disdain for snakes on a plane every time it comes up. I want to watch it with you. I'm down Comment to... Comment below if you think Brownie should watch and review snakes on a plane. I'm down to watch it. I mean, Also, that's... snakes on a train. Oh, well, snakes on a train. Snakes that's on bad. a plane versus snakes on a train. God, I mean, <sighs> snakes on a plane, like, that is... I discussed this on a, uh, a horror movie showdown that I love, like, killer snake movies. That's my mm -hmm. guilty pleasure with horror. Snakes on a Plane, I was super stoked for. And then I watched it, and I'm like, this is bad CGI. Ugh. This is like a stupid action movie with shitty CGI. You know, my grandfather's, Ugh. like, horribly, like, terrified of snakes and watched that movie once mm -hmm. at Nightmares for, like, multiple days. Well, if we want to watch a freaky snake movie, I know a couple. Uh, I didn't say that. But so I'm down to watch Snakes on a Plane. So rate it. So rate anyway, this. So sorry, anyway, we're getting distracted. We got way sidetracked, yes. Sorry. My point was, um, when I was much younger, I loved this movie, especially the sequel. Um, okay. As I've gotten older and I revisited it for the first time in God, probably about t 20 years, give or take, I still really enjoyed it, but it didn't quite do as much for me. Um, but I would still give this for everything it's worth and for the film itself, like a solid seven and a half. Like, I mm. think it's a really solid movie. It's just a fun little amusing movie that, especially for younger kids, if you have kids, it's a great one to watch that with them. It's a great family film. Yeah, I, I would give it a six. I mean, again, like I said, it didn't entertain me that much, but it would be a good one for kids. I agree. Um, solid. Particularly, I'm thinking, like, Kids that really like animals, specifically dogs. I know my younger brother was obsessed with dog movies, and I think we had a lot of dog movies. This is not one that we used to watch all the time, but um, either yeah. way, I, I would say six. I, yeah, I would say this is one of the best dog movies ever made. Now we debate have to think for about, another day. Yeah. Gosh. Now we gotta think about We have to do our movies. own showdown, but with dog movies. Gosh. We can invite Jay on. Jay, will you debate the best dog movies with us? I know you watch this. <laughs> oh, God. He, uh, he Jay, picked... I'll show down with you about dog movies, Jay. <laughs> Jay would totally pick Man's Best Friend, Flance Hendrickson, I bet. But I know Jay's a dog lover, too, so he'd probably have some good picks for that. <laughs> I issue you a challenge, Jay, but a friendly one. So. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, for future episodes, we're going to start adopting um, a new method for selecting our next film where we're going to put selections in a hat and pick from that. 
So. So. Remember our buddy Gigi's passed in front of the camera three times today? She um, knocked all the selections out of the hat, so they're scattered on the floor over here. But they are folded pieces of paper, so I'm just going to grab a folded piece of paper, and yeah. it will determine what our next review is. Yeah. And then the next episode, she, we will have a hat filled with her suggestions, and I will pick from that to determine the following one. And I think, interspersed with that, we will also have a suggestion hat. Yeah. Um, but anyway. So this is. That is our next review. Me picking one of Brian's choices for the next review. Here's my slip of paper. The next thing we are reviewing is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Ooh. I've never seen this. She loves musicals and I do not. And she has never seen this film. She's even seen the sequel, Shock Treatment. She's well, never seen that one. You saw it here first. If you can see over the ring light. But that says Rocky Horror Picture Show. So, next time we get together, that's what we're reviewing. I'm excited. I love this film. And uh, please make sure to like and subscribe. And leave mm -hmm. us comments down below. Leave us suggestions. We can mix them in every other one with each hat or something like that crazy. We're going to work on kind of revamping our image, getting like a good logo going. We're still in the early stages of this series, so this is kind of our welcome back episode after taking a break. Yeah. You know, the short season one and the season two premiere, hurrah, you know, like those TV shows always do and syndicated television, right? They keep cutting them down for syndication. <laughs> Sorry, Family Guy joke that really got me last night. We've watched way too much Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thanks for watching, and we'll be back again soon.